nice to see all of you. And uh, I'm here to share with you something that's very, very exciting, something completely new. And uh, my thanks to Hog Strike for really their unwavering wavering support over the last seven years of this project. Um, we're going to talk about a completely new way to do lens power calculations that doesn't use formulas. It uses a form of artificial intelligence um, and pattern recognition. And um, I think you're going to be excited by what I, I'm going to explain to you how this works. And then Mike Snyder is going to show you the results of the very first prospective study. But actually, every person on the DS here has been involved in this project, either as a core investigator or as a beta tester. And in fact, a project like this can only happen with the work of a lot of people. We actually currently have 24 physicians participating in 13 countries on this, but um, and, and also um, uh, uh, P Peter Maloney, our uh, project leader at MathWorks, one of the largest companies involved in this type of mathematics in, in the world. Um, these are our core investigators, um, and not here with us is Lee Wong at Baylor University, who works with, with Doug Koch, and also uh, David Goldblum, who's a professor of ophthalmology at the University of Basel in Switzerland. And we also have um, beta testers in Europe, the Middle East, Africa, North and South America, Asia, India, and Australia. In fact, Graham Barrett was very kind to give us uh, cases and work with us early on. So this is a very large project involving the insights and comments and, and work of many, many people over the last seven years. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about the elephant in the room. Every time one of us goes into the operating room to implant a multifocal lens, a toric lens, or a monofocal lens where it absolutely positively has to be right, this is always playing in the background for us. And what if we could make this even just a little bit better? That would really be worth something. Now, um, I've been involved in the Haggis formula optimization for, for more than a decade, and this is a summary of what we've found over the last 260,000 cases uh, that we've optimized. And although we all think we're really good, it's really less than 1% than of surgeons who are in the low 90s for half diopter accuracy. The second tier for this is 6% of surgeons who are about 84%, but the vast majority of, sur majority of surgeons, if you track your outcomes, you're somewhere between 74 and 80%. For this, uh, study 78% comes up a lot, but that's after the removal of obvious outliers and after the optimization of lens constants. So we're, we may not be quite as good as, as we all think we are. This is what 78% accuracy looks like, and if you're in the multifocal business or the refractive IOL business, I think we need to do better than this for you know, ophthalmology in general. We don't have a lot of time, but I'm just going to explain to you a little bit about how pattern recognition works. Um, and you know, what is, what's the advantage of doing something like this over formulas? Well, pattern recognition has the ability to learn tasks independent of what was previously known. And it also, also current formulas sort of limit situations to what's already understood. And one advantage of this is it's self-organizing. It creates its own representation of the data. And it's very well suited to the Chinese puzzle, which is the human eye. And think about this. For any given axial length, how many possible combinations are there of, anterior, of uh, ACD, lens thickness, central corneal power, white to white? The numbers go up almost exponentially. So we need something that can handle all these nonlinear relationships. And here's a little example of how a very crude form of pattern recognition works. This is using an artificial neural network. We're going to generate a thousand random input vectors, put them inside this little box, and ask an artificial neural network to tell us what the internal organization is. And you would think this is almost an impossible task. We're going to use um, a technique called feature extraction and feature matching, and we're going to run it through a computer 5,000 times and ask us to tell us what the organization is. Now, all of these dots are generated using something called the Manhattan Distance Generator, and the Manhattan's distance is really just the, the absolute sum of Cartesian coordinates. It looks like Manhattan City blocks, and that's where it gets its name. So here's 40 cycles, here's 120 cycles, here's 500 cycles, and here's 5,000 cycles, and this seemingly chaotic mess 
of, of just random stuff can actually be figured out by this form of mathematics. So the artificial neural network has come up with um, a self-organizing map. Now we can take this same way of thinking and we can apply it to intraocular lens calculations. There are a number of different tools. They're not exactly household terms, Gaussian process methods, stochastic process methods, creaking, polynomial models. We ended up with something called radial basis functions just because of the way it interpolates data. So we have a data point here and a data point here and a measurement points in between. We have a very sophisticated way of interpolating the data in four dimensions to come up with the right answer. This is very powerful, very exciting stuff. And with the scary fast computers that we now have available to us for large corporations like MathWorks, we can do some pretty stunning work. Now you would think radial basis functions, that's a pretty exotic kind of geeky mathematical term. It turns out that probably every single one of you that has an iPhone in your pocket is using radial basis functions and it's all around us. So here near the, the, near the Gulf of Mexico where the oil industry has, a, has a, a big presence, when they want to find how an oil field behaves, radial basis functions are used to map that behavior. The agriculture industry, the automotive industry, the motorcycle industry uses radial basis functions functions almost ubiquitously for the common things like spark plug timings and to calibrate engines. When the law enforcement wants to find the bad guy, they use radial basis functions for pattern recognition to identify uh, facial uh, features. And for the forward forecasting financial people, this is, this is like standard operating stuff for them. So people who are looking to see how the Dow Jones Industrial Average is going to behave or how this stock is going to move through the next quarter, radial basis functions are used for that. Other things like the audiology people use it to get rid of noise. If you have an iPhone and you put your fingerprint on it to identify yourself, chances are the program that identifies you is based in radial basis functions. And because this is pattern recognition, um, certain branches of medicine really like this, like cardiology. What's a rhythm strip? It's nothing more than a pattern. And this is a, an example of, a, uh, of an arrhythmia that can be overlooked very easily if you have microvolt variations in the, in the amplitude of the T wave after the QRS complex. Um, it can be a marker for sudden cardiac death. So this is used to identify things like torsades de points and uh, T-wave alternants. So how do we develop a calculator? And again, this is a seven-year project that we've been working on a lot. And we use the Hogstrite Lensstar because this was really, we had the best measurements, the highest density autokeratometry, um, axial measurements, all by, by optical biometry. So we chose this instrument in order to do this. So, again, we don't have a lot of time, but I'm going to show you basically how this works, and then I'll show you some of the basic results. We, we took 13 different variables, except for mother's maiden name, shoe size, favorite dessert, and uh, things like that, and, and came up with uh, what we thought were the most important 13 variables. It's things like uh, pupil size, spherical aberration, white to white, lens thickness. We did some brute force uh, computer modeling and determined that axial length, central corneal power, anterior chamber depth, and a spherical equivalent for a given IOL power were the four, four most important parameters we needed to look at. We took this organized pattern of data and then ran it through uh, the radial basis function activation functions at, at MathWorks and then compared what we got to what we knew was correct from our database uh, called a training set. And then like finding those little dots in the square, we ran this through again and again until the accuracy increased, increased, increased. And this is done by something called a backward propagation phase where we feed things back and it mathematically adjusts some things called weights. And it's amazing how accurate you can get this if you have enough data. With some of the initial testing we did, one of the first things that popped out was that there's no calculation bias. This methodology doesn't know that it's a long eye or short eye. All it knows is it's a pattern. And it does the best where it has the greatest amount of data. So this is one of our very first uh, efforts of about 600 and, case, uh, 600 and something cases. This is our half diopter accuracy. And these are the cases where that just fell outside the half diopter. So right from the beginning, we knew that we were onto something uh, pretty nice. Now, one of the problems with ophthalmology is it's full of ophthalmologists. And if you want to solve a problem in mathematics and physics, you don't ask ophthalmologists. Who do you ask? You ask physicists and you ask mathematicians. And that's why we went to MathWorks. And totally normal 
day-to-day -day types of things that mathematicians use, we in ophthalmology have never even heard of. So one of the in engineers at MathWorks said, well, gee, how about a boundary model? I said, you know, what, what's that? And they said, well, it's something that can increase the safety for your patient and also make your users uh, more confident. And I'll share with you basically what a boundary model is. Those of you with an engineering background know about this. This is a plot of central corneal power against axial length. And what we can do mathematically is we can create a boundary model within the confines of which we can identify the accuracy of the calculation. So this is a boundary model for an early effort in this program, and we can identify the cases where we can't resolve the question, but inside the boundary model, we can predict what the accuracy is going to be like. So what we've done is we've created an IOL power calculation method that is self-validating. This is, this is new ways of thinking. So this is the very first um, pattern recognition IOL calculator, and Doug Koch probably remembers this, you know, from our early stages. We used Microsoft Excel as a kind of our, our graphic interface, and below I've, I've shown the boundary model. So we're going to calculate for Plano. Here are our Ks. This is our ACD. This is our axial length. And you notice that all of the green dots are within the boundary model. So we get an IOL power, and we get a statement, and the statement says that for these four clouds of data working in four dimensions, we are in bounds and the accuracy can predict, be predicted for this. This is another example where the four, we have three of the four dots inside our boundary models. Outside the boundary model is this axial length, and it gives us an IOL power, but you know, heads up, you know, we may not be com entirely accurate. So some of the initial testing for this was uh, pretty exciting. This is our first uh, 681 cases, and what we found was we did a really good job, but this may not be a really accurate method of testing this because 80% of these cases were actually used to make the algorithm. So that's not exactly, you know, valid. But you can see that compared to the other, the others, we were, we were doing a good job. But again, we were, this, the, the formula saw these cases in the beginning when it was, when it was used to create itself. So this probably isn't accurate. Next is retrospective testing. And this blew our socks off. This is uh, 13 surgeons in eight countries. 3,212 cases, and these cases had never been seen by the algorithm. And you can see that we're in the, you know, we're in the, the, the low to mid 90s pretty much for everybody. The only flaw in this type of uh, study is that we were sampling the different boundary models where we knew the outcome. So if somebody came out minus one, we would sample the boundary model at minus one. And so we had a piece of information that could not be known prior to surgery, so this, this is, is really nice, but it's a little bit flawed in that we knew the outcome. But what really got our attention is remember that less than 1% of surgeons are at 92%, and about 6% of surgeons are at 84%. So really the only way to test this in a way that's, that stands up to scientific rigor is prospective testing. And then Mike Snyder is going to actually show us the results of the first large prospective study of this. Now, in an act of enormous generosity, Hogstrite has agreed to make available this technology to everyone as an online calculator, and it's free. And this is the URL. It's, it went live two days ago. And so all of us will have access to this, and you can use this to, run your own, to do your own calculations. This is what the landing page looks like. And if you want to know a little bit more about it, you just click on what is this. Up comes a little explanation. And for those of you who are even geekier than I am, who want to know what radial basis functions are, it'll take you to a Wikipedia page and show you the scary math involved behind this. If you enter the calculator, then you'll be brought into something that looks like this, looks just like the Lenstar. You can enter your information. And if it's an inbounds calculation, what you'll get is an IOL power. If you're out of bounds, if you put in 15 you know, millimeters for the axial length, you're going to get an out of bounds statement and you can't use this. For daily use, let's say you have some really bizarre combination of Ks, like Ks of 60 and an ACD of 5 or something like that, um, and it comes up with out of bounds, then just use you know, some, other, some other formula. This website's going to be used for data collection. It's very much like Wikipedia. It's an ongoing process where we're all going to have a stake in the game. Right now, it's based on about 3,400 cases. Imagine if we had 340,000 cases, how all of us could benefit from that. And, um, you know, we're all going to be part of the development process. This will be updated at six-month intervals based on data that we receive. So we're going to, what we're going to be doing is expanding the boundary model. And unlike, you know, older formulas like SRKT and Holiday 1, this is going to be constantly evolving. So every six months, the breadth and depth of the calculation accuracy will be expanded as we expand the boundary model. So this is really just the beginning. 
So in summary, this is uh, a completely new approach for IOL power calculations um, through the generosity of Hawk Stride and their sponsoring of this research for the last seven years uses um, uh, pattern recognition, data interpolation, and a validating boundary model. And the increase in accuracy of this over other methods is really based on an increased flexibility in the calculation methodology. This has been optimized for the Hawkstrite Lenstar. You can use other devices, but because of the, the increased density of keratometry and the axial, the unique form of the axial measurements, this is the device that's meant to be used for this. And personally, I see the future of IOL power calculations as being very bright, and every six months, I think we're going to be able to up the game. So that elephant in the room, hopefully, will begin to, to fade away, and we'll all be, do, be doing better because of this work. Thank you. Thanks, Warren.